next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10672 in the name of Annabel Ewing on remembering the contribution of those who built the dams and tunnels. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Ms Ewing, if you are ready, would you like to open the debate? You have seven minutes or thereby, please. I thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate uh, is indeed timely for it is being held against the backdrop of new deck figures out uh, today showing not only that Scotland's renewable energy generation in the first half of 2014 was 30% higher compared to the same period in 2013, but also that this overall increase is primarily due to a 50% increase in hydro generation. Uh, it is surely a source of great pleasure and pride across the chamber that Scotland is indeed at the vanguard of the renewables revolution. Uh, and it is now estimated that over 46.4% of gross electricity consumption in 2013 was met from renewables, up from 39.9% in 2012. It is also worth noting that Scotland contributed some 32% of the UK's renewable energy generation in 2013, and that Scotland continues to be a net exporter of electricity, uh, uh, and of course, uh, it is on track to meet our ambitious interim uh, target of generating 50% of electricity consumption from renewable uh, sources by 2015. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity uh, today to acknowledge that our leading position is due in no small part to the extent of generation from hydroelectric schemes, big and small, across particularly the north of Scotland uh, and, and in areas such as the Lednock Dam and the Glen Turret Dam in Strathairn, the area in which I live. In fact, Scotland has 85% of the UK's hydroelectric energy resource, much of it developed by the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board in the 1950s. The Hydro Board, as it was known, uh, which brought power from the Glens, was a nationalised industry at the time, although it was privatised in 1989 and is now part of Scottish and Southern Energy PLC. A great deal of the credit, presiding officer, for the development in hydropower must, of course, go to Tom Johnson, the Secretary of State for Scotland in Churchill's wartime coalition government, for he had a vision of bringing power from the Glens for the benefit of all. At the time, it was estimated that just one farm in six and one croft in a hundred had electricity. Today, virtually every home in Scotland has mains electricity. I think that that credit is well deserved, presiding officer, but I would submit that the credit uh, should also be shared. For in preparation for this debate, I have been reading uh, a booklet produced by uh, Scottish and Southern Energy entitled Power from the Glens, uh, which I'm pleased to note has been dedicated, and I quote, to the memory of the Hydro Boys, whose legacy is the largest source of renewable energy in the country. Whilst the SIC booklet refers at one point to men coming from all over Scotland and to Czechs and to Poles and to Germans, it makes no mention of the hundreds of Irish men who were such an important part of the building of the hydro schemes. It was concerns raised with me about the gaps in the recognition of their work that led me to lodge this motion in the first place, and I am extremely grateful for the opportunity, presiding officer, that this debate affords me uh, to give some well-deserved publicity to their contribution and to bring to wider attention those hardy men and the sacrifice of those who gave their health or even their lives. I want to mention at this point a constituent, John O'Donnell and others who, through a very interesting Facebook group called Memories of the Hydro Dams and Tunnels, have been putting in a power of work to share stories and songs that have, until very recently, been heard only within their own families and are well-deserving of a wider audience. By the time major hydro development ended in the mid-1960s, Scotland could boast of 56 dams connected by over 600 kilometres. Uh, certainly. Mary Scanlon. Presiding officer, can I thank the member for mentioning the Irish men? And can I take this opportunity to say that my mother's two brothers, who were called O'Donnell, both worked on the dams in Perthshire and indeed the Highlands throughout the 50s. And I'd like to thank the member for mentioning the men, particularly from Donegal. I, I thank the, the member. 
I thank the member for her contribution that is uh, now on the record of her family, her own family's contribution to the building uh, of the dams, uh, and rightly so. Um, so we, we see uh, 600 kilometres of rock tunnel, aqueducts and pipelines, and at its peak there were over 12,000 people working on dams and tunnels. The history of the building of these dams and the tunnels associated with them is an extremely interesting one, with fascinating stories like that of the Tunnel Tigers working on the St Philan section of the Bredalbain Hydroelectric Scheme, who set a world record by tunnelling 557 feet in seven days back in 1955. It was hard, dangerous work, presiding officer. A number of men tragically lost their lives and countless others would have been injured or carried the effects of the work for the rest of their lives. As I have already alluded to, the men came from all over uh, to work in the tunnels and on the dams. Poles, Czechs, Highlanders and huge numbers, as we've heard of Irishmen from Donegal and other places, came to live in the camps and work on the hydro schemes. Many of them stayed, presiding officer, and their descendants are at the heart of communities across uh, many parts of Scotland, including Strathairn uh, in my part of the world. Little wonder that it is a real bone of contention, therefore, for those whose fathers and grandfathers worked in the tunnels, that inexplicably some of the public visitor information boards which exist at SSE sites compound the omission in the booklet I referred to earlier and list several nationalities who worked in the tunnels but make no reference to Irishmen. A decent memorial to all of those who worked on the schemes and accurate public information at all the dams is surely not a big ask and I feel confident that SSE will be amenable to what amounts to a bit of uh, tidying up of their corporate history. In this regard, there are very welcome signs that we are pushing at an open door and indeed not long after I first lodged this parliamentary motion, Gillian O'Reilly, Head of Heritage and Community Programmes at SSE, said on their website, we are enormously proud of our hydro heritage and have recently undertaken a project to understand and share the amazing stories of people and engineering feats that provided power often to many remote areas throughout Scotland. Our plans for a new visitor centre in Putlochry will provide a fitting memorial to those who worked in the projects and we will continue to work with local historians, stakeholders and colleagues to determine the best way to do this. The official histories and visitor information have in the past tended to focus on the engineering achievements rather than the contribution made and human costs paid by the workers and that does need to be addressed. Of course we invite people to marvel at the hollow mountains and the great dams and many do with for example the Pitlochry Dam and Salmon Ladder attracting some 500,000 visitors annually and people from across the world go to see it. But let us also invite them to remember the men who swung the pick and set the charge. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'm extremely pleased to note that SSE appear to be so amenable to ensuring that this uh, uh, is done. And it would be helpful if the Scottish Government, when responding today, would confirm today its support too. I would also suggest to anyone who has stories to tell to contact SSE Direct to ensure that this living history is not lost. This is a campaign that deserves everyone's support, as I am sure that we can all recognise the huge debt of gratitude that we owe to those whose efforts brought us the power from the glens that we take so much for granted today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And now Colin Richard Simpson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Can I particularly welcome this debate and Annabel Ewing obtaining it, and I will explain why in a minute for personal reasons. But I want to begin by concurring with her that it was Tom Johnson whose vision as Secretary of State during the Second World War uh, really led to the creation of the Scottish Hydro Board, which he then chaired, developing, amongst other things, the Pitlochry, Fish Ladder and Dam between 1947 and 1951, damming up the River Tummel to form Loch Fascali, some five kilometres in length. Uh, Mr Simpson, pull your microphone up a little, please. My apologies. That better? My apologies. Uh, the, and, and introduced the, the salmon ladder, which was, uh, I think, an important innovation and, and a recognition of actually the environmental aspects of these, of these, uh, of these um, creations. Why I'm particularly pleased is because I want to talk a little bit about the Kruchen power station, because I worked there. Um, I uh, was, uh, as a student, I, uh, I looked around for employment at a level of uh, remuneration worthwhile undertaking, and it was the best offer that I got. Um, three of us, three students, were amongst those who joined many Irishmen, as you have said, in that particular construction, working deep underground uh, in a situation where we were often faced with having to go back up to the face to drill when the dust was still in our faces. I have to say that the thing that impressed me most about it was the fact that the 
health regulations, which were pretty primitive at the time, were not observed. And in fact, when I went down that particular, into that particular job, daily going down it for many hours, um, what, it, what it did for me was it converted me from a family which was extremely conservative into becoming a socialist. And I believed at that point that the protection of workers was absolutely fundamental and has been fundamental to my entire political career. Every weekend when we emerged from the underground of that Kruikern power station, we had buzzing in our ears, which lasted the whole weekend. Uh, and in fact, I have had tinnitus in, in, in my ears ever since that occasion. Uh, it, it, when I confronted the a senior person in the, in the works with the fact that I thought they were not looking after the health of the workers in the way that they should. I was to, and said that the inspectors would not be pleased. I was told, don't worry, they have to give us 48 hours notice. We'll get everything right by the time that occurs. Now, I'm not going to name the company. I think the company is actually a very good one now and actually because of health and safety has uh, followed on extremely well. But the th of the three of us, and uh, uh, one of us, uh, uh, jacked the job in, as they called it in those days, within two weeks because he couldn't tolerate it. Partly because he was working in wet often, up to, up to uh, well into the, the mid-calf, uh, and the noise also he, he couldn't tolerate. Another one who was a theology student from St. Andrews University tried to hold prayer meetings. I tried to form a trade union and I got sacked. So my memories of this, which uh, Annabel Ewing's very pertinent uh, uh, motion has, has brought back, I think, uh, 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 is, is something which I, I, I want to honour those men. The driller, to whom I was an assistant, and whose place I took after four weeks, left to go to the Clyde Tunnel. And it may surprise people to know that he left because it was safer to work in the Clyde Tunnel, despite the fact it was under pressure and there was a risk of bends, than it was at Kruken. Thirty-six men died in the construction of that crew, and my parents were terrified about the fact that I might actually get killed. In the vertical shaft, it was extremely dangerous to work. But in the, in the, in the uh, Clyde Tunnel, it was also difficult. It was wet, it was difficult, uh, and, and the, the bends were always something at risk, and there are people who've suffered from that, but only two men died. These tunnelers and uh, the constructors we owe a great debt to, and I'm very proud of the fact that Annabel Ewing has moved this motion, and I hope some of these memories are, are, are of uh, uh, interest to the SSE and may be incorporated in a revision of what they're talking about in the, in the uh, uh, visitor centres, which are so important to our tourism. Thank you very much. Now I call on Marder Fraser to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, uh, congratulate uh, Annabel Ewing on securing uh, this uh, debate uh, and uh, on her uh, motion. Um, I think uh, she referred to the uh, Pitlochry Dam and uh, the fish ladder in her remarks. That's a, uh, a very important part of the Highland pasture economy. I think she quoted the figure of 500,000 visitors a year. I'm not sure that's quite right. I think it's 50,000 visitors a year uh, who, who come currently to visit the Pitlochry Dam. And the hope is by uh, spending money on, on improving the attraction that the SSE will double that number to 100,000 a year. It's interesting if you go to Pitlochry and you see what is now Loch Fascally, you would think it had always been there, but in fact it was only created uh, between 1947 and 1951 when uh, the, uh, the River Tummel was dammed, flooding an area that previously had been the old Pitlochry Highland Games field, which created the current loch. And the loch, of course, is used by, by tourists and by locals for, for fishing and for, and for boating, and it's become a very uh, accepted part of the local landscape. Yes, of course. Annabel Ewing. It's out, and it may be that it's a typo in the SSE booklet, which they might want to address, but they do refer to a figure of 500,000 per annum, so we wait to see. Perhaps there might be clarification coming. Commander Fraser. Okay, well, we, 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 we will no doubt get the resolution of this at, at, at some point after the, the debate. But I think if you, go, if you travel around either Perthshire or the Highlands, the uh, impact of the hydroelectric schemes is is obvious to all, and I think an important part of them is how they've now become an accepted part of the landscape and how indeed they are used to uh, attract visitors and information boards that uh, Annabel Ewing referred to is a very important uh, part of this. There is an interesting history to hydroelectricity in the Highlands. The very first scheme was built by the monks at Fort Augustus Abbey in 1890, an 18 kilowatt scheme to power the organ 
uh, and to provide street lighting to the village then of 800 people. And repeatedly, when the organ was being played, the lights in the village dimmed because there wasn't enough power to do both. And of course, we saw uh, throughout the 1930s and then the 40s and 50s a huge expansion in terms of hydroelectric power uh, across the area. I was very interested to listen to um, uh, Richard Simpson recount his experiences uh, at uh, Kruikin. I, I visited the Kruikin tunnel some, some years ago myself, and it's uh, an extremely impressive piece of, of engineering. Uh, Mary Scanlon talked about her family connection to the uh, tunnels and dams. Uh, I have one myself, because my, my own father, in his younger days as a mechanical fitter, worked on the Glaskarnak Dam uh, in Russia. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, if he followed quite the same political path that Richard Simpson did as a result of uh, his experience working at Glaskarnik. But there were men working with him from across Scotland and many other uh, parts of the British Isles and many other parts of the world. It was very hard work, as Richard Simpson said. There were different conditions from today. There was nothing like the same level of health and safety as we would uh, see on a, on a modern uh, site. And I think we should celebrate the fact that uh, conditions have been improved for workers on sites like this. I think what makes it uh, perhaps all the more remarkable how much was achieved, and, and uh, in her motion, Annabel Ewing makes reference to the, the, uh, the, the tunnelers at, at Lednock. Um, if you reflect just on the most recent large-scale hydroelectric scheme at Glen Doe, uh, near Fort Augustus in the Highlands, constructed uh, by SSE, which was only operational for a matter of months before there was a large uh, roof cave-in, and was then offline for, well, more than a year, uh, and they had to uh, redig the tunnel as a result. And it's remarkable that the tunnels that were built in the 50s and 60s, none of them seem to have gone through the same turmoil that our most recent construction saw uh, just uh, a few years ago uh, at Glen Doe. So I agree with uh, the sentiments expressed in the debate. I think the, the workers from wherever they came from who uh, contributed to this development of this industry in Scotland and created not just that legacy of power, but also that legacy that is so important to tourism should be celebrated. And I support Annabel Ewing's ambitions for a proper memorial. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Stuart Stevenson, after which move the closing speech of the Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and congratulations to my colleague on uh, bringing this uh, motion forward and giving us time to debate the important uh, matters that the motion raises. Um, like others, uh, connections with, uh, with this and the various. I, I, among the many jobs I've had, I've never worked on a hydro scheme or in a tunnel, except when I was about 10 or 11 when we used to build tunnels with a, a former tunneler from a Stalag Luft uh, prisoner war camp. But that's a very, very different thing not to be compared with this at all. But what we did do as a family, we used to uh, camp very regularly at our Gwalach farm, uh, which is just below the Queen's View uh, on Loch Tummel. And one of the highlights of all our visits there was to visit the Salmon Ladder. Uh, my father, myself, my brother, we were enthusiastic brown fish, uh, brown trout uh, fishermen, and to go and gaze in awe at uh, the big brother, uh, Salmon, Salmoness, uh, the Salmon, uh, was uh, something that was well worth doing. Uh, and to aspire to be able to catch that. But of course, that would have required us to pay out money for a license or find some other way of being able to fish for salmon, which of course we would not have contemplated doing. Now, the issue of building dams and tunnels is quite a substantial engineering one. We sometimes forget uh, how much the Victorians uh, really achieved in their engineering. Uh, look at the Union Canal, perhaps a topical name for a canal, uh, which traverses the whole of central Scotland with a rise and fall of no more than four inches. And think of the Victorians' achievements in doing that. And in building uh, tunnels and uh, building bridges and coffer dams, they developed a very impressive set of technology. Now, some of the challenges are quite substantial. The adiabatic lapse rate means that for every 1,000 feet you go down, the temperature rises by 1.98 degrees. The barometric pressure rises by 33 millibars for every 1,000 uh, feet. You're exposed to the release of, in particular, methane when you're in underground workings. So there are a wide range of natural challenges to which you add the challenge uh, that Richard Simpson uh, made reference in the dust from the working, 
perfectly contained and held in a close environment uh, for those who are working there uh, to inhale uh, to the substantial uh, detriment of their health. So when uh, the Lednock Tunnel Tigers uh, tunneled 557 feet in a week, that was a huge achievement. Now, of course, you were able to do that perhaps because the rock and the, the area you were tunneling through was comparatively soft. But of course, if that was so, that increases the risks of roof fall and people being killed from that. Uh, it's unlikely they were grilling through granite at that rate uh, of knots. So formidable challenges which we can admire uh, from a distance. I do, like others, have a connection with the benefits uh, of electricity. My wife, who lived in a council house a mere six miles out on the main road down to uh, Fort William from Inverness, um, was, I believe, at secondary school before they got electricity. Uh, and that was, of course, from the, the work of the hydro. And to this day, the very large oil lamp that used to illuminate the house, um, by which my wife did her early studying when she was at school, now adorns our living room. And a very impressive, I think it's about two and a half feet tall, a piece of kit it is. So there is nothing that the Irish and the other workers, including Dr. Simpson, as we now know, uh, who achieved what they did in building our dams and tunnels and contributed to our being one of the most green uh, sources of electricity quite early in the idea that that was a good thing to do, but more fundamentally getting electricity into the hills and glens is a substantial achievement that I'm delighted we're able to celebrate today. And I look forward to visiting the new facilities which will tell the tale again in a modern context and perhaps redress that omission in relation in particular to the Irish navvies and others who made such a big contribution. Presiding officer. Yeah, thanks. I now call Minister Fergus Ewing to wind up the debate on behalf of the government. Mr Ewing, seven minutes or thereby, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I congratulate uh, Annabel Ewing on bringing this important matter to the Scottish Parliament to debate. And I, I thank all members who have spoken in this debate and contributed to it for their contributions. Uh, I think uh, both Annabel Ewing and Dr Richard Simpson mentioned the pivotal role and the leadership and vision demonstrated by the great Tom Johnston who, when he was Secretary of State for Scotland, presiding officer, really ran Scotland uh, as though it were a de facto independent country. Such was the untrammeled ability he had to drive things forward. Uh, so there we are, an unexpected his historical precedent. Uh, but of course, um, last year, when many of us, including Murdo Fraser, celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Hydroelectric Development Scotland Act in 1943 and the role that Tom Johnson played, the enormous role he played in the development of that story, uh, we reflected also that in order to deliver his vision, it required, I think as Annabel Ewing stressed, the toil, the labor, the labor of uh, a degree of uh, kind of severity that is perhaps beyond our imaginings these days, I would suspect, uh, to deliver uh, those projects, those civil engineering projects, those dams, those hydroelectric schemes. And therefore, it's absolutely correct that we take the time to recognize the massive contribution of the workers that handed Scotland a legacy of large-scale renewable energy provision that continues and continues, as was remarked, successfully and effectively to generate uh, electricity to this day. The legacy also was uh, of enormous benefit to the north of Scotland, where I have the privilege of representing the constituency. In 1945, only one half of the homes had, in the Highlands had access to electricity. By 1960, that had increased to 90% due to large-scale hydro developments, giving more than 200,000 households access to modern comforts. The scale of the construction work is indeed impressive. Between 1945 and 1965, in just 20 years, presiding officer, 78 dams were built, 2,000 miles of tunnel excavated, 
and 20,000 miles of electricity network established. We divide time, do we not, presiding officer, into before Christ and Anno Domini. I suspect that civil engineers, were they to look for a classification of time, would use the initials BR before the regulators existed. Tom Johnson was not uh, uh, unduly hampered by uh, heritage or environment uh, regulators. He got on with the job. And what a magnificent legacy has been left to the country thereby. At its peak, more than 12,000 people were employed with workers from a great many countries, from Ireland, prisoners of war and displaced persons from Germany, Italy, Poland and Czechoslovakia, joining squads of native Highlanders, many of whom, like Richard Simpson, had never been before been paid such high wages. And the workers known as the Hydro Boys had to work in remote locations uh, and in dangerous conditions. And I should say that from discussions today with SSE, they are absolutely determined to emphasize the recognition of all workers, including Irish workers, which was remarked on by Mary Scanlon and Annabel Ewing. And this will be dealt with in visitor books and sites. And I'm happy to clarify that, as I am to pay tribute to SSE for the work that they've done in producing this booklet. And I, I think that Gillian O'Reilly of SSE has a, a role to play here in The Power from the Glens. And also to Emma Wood in her 2005 book, The Hydro Boys, which uh, uh, certainly merits a reading. Because we recognize the, the huge dangers of, of work, and I was very grateful actually that Dr. Simpson contributed to this debate, reminding us of the importance of health and safety. Uh, and I myself, of course, uh, in various roles, have had involvement in relation to that matter, in relation to the oil and gas industry and the the coal mining industry, and I remember being struck by reading social history about the coal mining industry and the appalling cruelty towards workers, including young children, especially in the 19th century, where disaster after disaster happened before legislative reform, uh, and it was always too little, too late. And it, it did occur to me, listening to David, uh, to Richard Simmons, I'm sorry, that perhaps our understanding and appreciation of social history is in a sense the very best compulsator to drive forward our focus on health and safety legislation right now. It was Lord Cullen who remarked to me when I met him this summer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 25th anniversary of Piper Alpha that, it, that uh, BP and Macondo perhaps forgot to be afraid. And therefore the role that social history plays as Annabel Ewing has brought to this chamber is an important one. Now, uh, of course, uh, hydroelectric power plays a very important part, and we are all, I think, very keen to see it continue. Uh, we are at the moment concerned that a defect in the hydro feed-in tariff subsidy, which uh, we have raised with the UK government for, I think, over a year now, is causing a very serious threat to the industry, presiding officer. And we very much hope that working together, that can be rectified before this year is out. Uh, Murdo Fraser was correct to draw attention to the tourism benefits, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, I think, by all speakers. And the proposal to upgrade the visitor center of SSC at the Pitlochry Dam and Salmon Ladder is very much welcomed. It's a marvelous example of how civil engineering can protect the environment. Uh, uh, and the, the fact that there are half a million visitors a year shows the interest that there is in this matter. In conclusion, presiding officer, uh, hydroelectricity is one of the great industrial and economic success stories of Scotland. All too often, whilst correctly rec recognizing the leadership role that Tom Johnston and others played, we neglect to remember the efforts of the workers who actually delivered the schemes. Uh, it is therefore a great pleasure that I can say to Annabel Ewing, and if I may say so, presiding officer, my sister, uh, that I am very pleased that uh, she has brought forward this opportunity for us today to remember and to celebrate uh, and recognize the huge benefits that the hydro workers played, uh, leaving Scotland a wonderful legacy. Many thanks, and thank you all, and I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30 this afternoon. <laughs>